Hey everybody, welcome to the Ironworks Podcast. I'm Pastor Tyler. And I'm Zach. And we are very excited to get back into our discussion of spiritual disciplines today. We did uh, two last time and we're going to do four today and we'll finish up our list of 10 next time. But Zach, why don't you remind us, what is the definition of a spiritual discipline? What are we talking about here? We talked about just these repetitive things. We called them kind of spiritual deadlifts, these practices that we are told to do scripturally that help in our sanctification. Remember, we talked about uh, how this isn't legalism to expect this of ourselves because scripture doesn't say that these things are needed for salvation. These are things that now that we're saved, they build us up into the image of Jesus. And we kind of got that conversation started last time and now we're rolling through uh, some more. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we we need practices as Christians, mm. and this is something that uh, I don't know if this is a Protestant thing. I don't know if this is just an individualist thing, or if it's the 2022 thing. <laughs> but uh, we are are reluctant sometimes to talk about practices, to talk about disciplines like this. But we need them. We have them for everything. Whether you're doing something artistic, whether you're doing something athletic, if it's in business, you've got to have these repetitive things that you do that are going to make you better. And like you said, that's not that's not heresy. We are saved by grace, but it is the grace of God that leads us to to do these things, to discipline ourselves, to obey the Lord. And last time we looked at uh, the study of the Bible and the reading of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So we, that's all one thing really, but we broke it down into two that you have to read your Bible and you have to study your Bible. And I mean, Zach, how does that build you up? Like, what does that do for you? Just as a quick recap, what does that do for you? If deadlifts, all right, are going to make you stronger. If running laps is going to make you faster, make your, your heart stronger. What is what is the advantage of reading and studying the Bible? I think for me, it's like it constantly, number one, you're drawing in information, which is not a bad thing. You're getting what God wanted to say to you. <laughs> and he put that all in one place and you're, you're studying that. That seems really important if God spoke to you, right? So we're getting that. I think also consistently doing that constantly reminds me that this is the way I think. This is what I think about this. This is what God has said. And so it kind of, it's easy for me to forget those things and deciding I'm going to do it every day. I'm going to spend time in God's word. It kind of reminds me of who I am and who God is. Um, Also, it's a really good lead in just practically. It's a great thing that goes along with some of these other disciplines we're going to talk about. You know, studying God's word teaches you what to think. And then the other disciplines kind of help you to walk that out. Right. Um, Yeah. So much of like other spirituality. And I'm specifically thinking of like, you know, we don't really call it new age anymore because it's really been corporatized and it's been, you know, like, like we tend to do with anything spiritual, sand the serial numbers off and and kind of make use of it. Right. Um, But that has an awful lot to do with subjectivity. You know, you're, what do you think about life? What do you think about mm-hmm. the universe? It truly doesn't matter what, you know, what you believe in. Um, like, that's not what we have as Christians. We have the truth. We have a book. Uh, it's it's very much an intellectual exercise, but it's a spiritual one too. And if you're going to talk about God or interact with God or any of that, you've got to know and you've got to diligently seek to understand, right? That's, uh, Bible makes a big deal about understanding, especially in the Old Testament and mm-hmm. truth. And in the New Testament, Paul will say, like, if this isn't true, then and we're pathetic. <laughs> right. And so we, we've got to know what the truth is. And so that's that's pretty obvious, I think. And the rest of these are going to be pretty obvious too. But uh, spiritual discipline, if you want to grow as a Christian, you got to read your Bible, got to study your Bible, you know, get it in quantity, get it in quality. And now we're going to move on to our next one. So Zach, what is the next spiritual discipline we're going to talk about today? We're just going to keep right on rolling. We're going to talk about prayer. Uh, this is this is one that I think is um, what, what do we say that there's there's a couple uh, messages you can teach as a pastor that'll make everybody feel guilty and pray more is like a really yeah. easy one right pray more yep give more yep. evangelize more serve more and uh, probably another one in there I, I, th- I think there's five but yeah, yeah, yeah. I tithe more pray more evangelize more serve more. Yeah. Uh, maybe read your Bible more. I don't know. Yeah, but they're they're okay. easy, right? Yeah, you, of course. Everybody's going to feel bad about about that because who reads their Bible enough? Right. And it's kind of interesting <laughs> that those are a lot of those are disciplines, right? And like, because we all know that we should be doing these things. And that's kind of the point of it's called a discipline for a reason. Your flesh doesn't like it. Right. And I think prayer is a really big part of that in our culture. Like in our day and age, you, we're, we're asking people, Christians are saying, look, I want you to sit still. I want you to put your phone down. I want you to turn the TV off. And I want you to think about and speak to the Lord for like, let's try five minutes at a start and maybe we'll move up from there. That's actually a really difficult thing. It's if you've ever tried, yeah, it's countercultural. It's a difficult thing to do. And that's to me why it's a discipline. It's it's saying I'm going to, for 
this period of time, I'm going to be different as a person than the whole world is trying to press me into a mold. I'm going to be a different kind of person. I'm going to sit here and treat the Lord as more important than the way that the rest of the world wants me to live. So yeah, prayer, I've said before, is is one of the the exclusively spiritual things that we do. Prayer makes absolutely no sense if you do not believe this, because right. there is no... Uh, there's no practical, and I'm going to be you know, careful as I say this, there's practical utility to prayer. You know, if we, especially if we separate prayer from meditation. If you're speaking to God and interceding and for somebody and, and offering supplication. If you don't believe any of this, then there's no, there's no benefit that you get from it other than feeling good for doing what you were supposed to. And so it's a test of faith because you feel yeah, like you're wasting time and your flesh will feel like it's a waste of time. But um, I believe it was Martin Luther who, who said uh, prayer is a great saver of time, uh, that you'll, you're more effective after you've prayed than when you haven't. So, I mean, let's just start with a, with a definition here, Zach. I mean, what is prayer just in its most fundamental most fundamental definition? I don't think it's a tricky one, but it's Talking to this? God, right? You're, yeah, talking to God. You're speaking to God. You're you're, and and that's kind of the thing. I think this is why prayer is one of the harder spiritual disciplines for a lot of people is because you, like you said, you have to have faith. What does the scripture say? God, if you, if you you have to believe that God is right, He He is there. You're not just Hebrews. talking to the universe, right? Oh, I just I just speak my prayers and and someone listen. No, you have to believe that God is, and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And those are both hard things to do. They require faith. You have to say, look, Lord, I'm I'm trusting that you're listening to me and I'm trusting that you want to do something <laughs> about this, whatever I'm praying about, whether it's some problem I have or whether it's, look, I want to be closer to you and I'm trusting that you want to reveal yourself to me. That's a kind of a scary thing if you think about it, what you're doing, right? You're, you're putting yourself in front of God and saying, could you, you know, please listen to me? Yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's, it, it requires faith. And um, yeah. it's Hebrews eleven six is that yeah. verse. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists or that he is as literal there, but must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Mm. I mean, right there, that, that kind of debunks or blows a hole in a lot of, lot of philosophy that claims to be Christian today, isn't it? It's like, you must. If you want to please God, you must believe that he exists, duh. And that he'll, he'll answer if you call upon him. And that's what prayer is, is just simply speaking to God. You know, I've heard it said many times, and I totally agree with it, but I don't want to take credit for this idea, that Christians before, or the people of God, shall we say, before the Bible came, they still had communion and fellowship with God because they had prayer and, and they had mm. sacrifice, which is like a, a heightened form of, of prayer, if you want to call it that. And uh, they're in the New Testament, they didn't have all of the scripture, but they had prayer. And if you are in a, in a closed country where you can't have the Bible, you can pr still pray. If you're ever locked up and, and you don't have access to the Bible, you can still commune with God because you can pray. And this is where, it's, while you never want to separate these things entirely, it's good to remember that we, we don't worship the Bible, but we're worshiping the God who gave us the Bible. And the Bible is, mm -hmm. our, is our guidebook about who he is and what is right and what is true. But prayer has to be the essential step. Because you have to now begin to speak to the God that gave you this thing. And, I mean, it's totally possible, isn't it, for someone to know their Bible, read their Bible, and yet have no meaningful knowledge of God Oh, whatsoever. gosh, yeah. I've been there, <laughs> you know, early on in my Christian life. And I'm not even talking about people that are unsaved, necessarily. Yeah, no, no, no. There are people in the church that know yes. all about God, but they don't know Him. Lots of information. And, and I think it's a good reminder for us that, look, an unsaved person can read the Bible and be instructed by it, learn things from it, maybe even become a little bit of a better person because of that. But only a saved person is going to be able to pray truly. Right. And yes. so that's like you said, that's why it's this uniquely spiritual thing. It's like you're the only person that's going to be able to do that is a person who is coming to God, having faith in him. And, and you're going to know that that's true because you're going to hear from God. And I know that we get, you know, we get weird about this in the church. Sometimes we, we start saying, oh, well, hang on. You can't tell people those things. Look, I don't know why. And I want to ask you this, Tyler. What, what is because I hear this about prayer a lot it, nowadays is people say a thing that I think they mean they mean a good they're not being, they mean well, but they say this thing where they say, you know, the important thing to remember about prayer is that it changes you. They say prayer, prayer, prayer doesn't change things so much as it changes you. Now I, I understand what they mean by that, but like, maybe you could talk about like, wh why do you think that's maybe not a really good way to look at prayer? Cause I, th yeah. I know we've talked about this before. That's one of those things where the point is well taken. Yeah. 
Uh, I understand where people, you know, prayer is not about changing things. It's about changing me. Um, that is true in one sense that you, we need to be corrected. And very often we have things that we ask for that are not right. Sure. James talks about us uh, not receiving because we do not ask and yep. not receiving after we ask because we ask amiss that we may spend it on our pleasure. So or yeah, that's the Psalms, right? Where David starts, he's praying one thing and then you can almost hear God like changing his heart as he prays and he kind of winds up in this different place, right? So that's, that's part of it, yeah, I guess. So, and treating God like a vending machine or a celestial Santa Claus, yep. that's not good, but Prayer is also about receiving an answer from God. Mm. And there we'll we'll talk about this in a minute here that prayer is about there, there's a number of different kinds of prayer. I mean, there's just getting to know God where you're not really asking for anything. There's confession, there's adoration, all this. Uh, but how many times in the New Testament does it say ask and you will receive? Mm-hmm. And and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And, you know, the Holy Spirit said to Ananias, said, Behold, he's praying about Paul. And it was a significant thing. So Yes, it's about getting to know God, and it grows you as a person. But I think prayer also is is not just a means of getting to know God. It is also a means of partnering with God to fulfill the Great Commission and to live out the life that he's assigned to you. You see this throughout the book of Acts, that they would partner with God. They said, the Holy Spirit said... Or they were in prayer and asking, and the Lord said unto them, and they they would then go out and do what God was telling them to do. Right. So uh, prayer is is receiving. It's not just asking. And I don't think it's carnal to say, I, I expect and I desire to see an answer to the prayers that I'm lifting up to the Lord. And I, I think some of this can come, if I can say this graciously, this can come from a, a an overdeveloped sense of uh, Calvinism. An overdeveloped sense sure. of predestination, shall we say. If you believe that God is so sovereign that nothing happens that is outside his will and that everything has been rigidly predetermined, it's entirely inappropriate to pray, right? It's mm. and Not everybody says this. And they're the best, of course, the Reformed teachers and everything, they avoid that. And they'll say things along the lines of prayer is the means by which God has ordained his sovereign will. Sure, I yeah. think that's true. I think it's – I'm not a Calvinist per se, so – I. You know, I'm not anti-Calvinist, but, you know, we're Calvary Chapel. We're somewhere in the middle. I think that you miss what prayer is to be, that is Mm. asking and receiving. There are things that will happen because you pray that would not have happened otherwise. And there are things that will not happen because you failed to pray. Mm. That is absolutely to be seen throughout Scripture, Uh, even in the Old Testament, before uh, before we had Jesus. And that's, I want to pause here and back up just a little bit. This is a great conversation, but talking about prayer, um, I kind of just gave away the answer, but I mean, Zach, what right do we have to pray? Like, aren't we sinners? Like we're, you know, everybody, everybody seems to assume, <laughs> right. I think because we've been baked into a Christian culture uh-huh. that God will hear me when I pray. But what right do you have to expect that God will hear you? Well, you don't other than what scripture has said, which is in the Old Testament. It, You know, God started talking to Abraham first, right? And said, hey, like, yeah, God go, initiates conversation. Right. Go over here, do this and that. And in that, God set up a covenant with Abraham and the covenant included sacrifice that was going to make Abraham okay to approach God. Right. Even from day one. And then with the, we see with the children of Israel. That's very key that they needed a a sacrifice. Yeah. In other words, Abraham wasn't able to just start walking up and talking to God. God first had to say, I I am calling you my friend. I am asking certain things of you so that you can be part of my covenant. And because of that, now we can have this communion together. Right. And then you see that with the children of Israel, that God was like, do not come up to the mountain. Yeah. Right. Do not, don't do that. Send these couple people up. They will come up into my presence. We will talk. I will speak to my servant Moses face to face. But then God gives them the, this sanctuary and, yeah. and a set of ways to come and to pray. I mean, the whole sacrificial system was basically like, you've got to do this so you can come be with me. And if you don't do this, you can't come be with me. Yeah. So this is something we talked about a lot at our church. We were studying through the book of Leviticus. Yeah. Uh, one of the last sentences of the book of Exodus is it said that the glory of the Lord descended upon the tabernacle and it was so thick that they couldn't even go inside. And that's, it's, it's a very, it's a brilliant literary device in that it is as a conclusion to Exodus, it is very optimistic. Like, wow, the glory of the Lord is here. But as a beginning to the book of Leviticus, it's, it's very (laughs) sad. We can't go in. And that's absolutely true. They can't go in. And even on the first day when they ordained the priest, two of them were consumed because they offered strange fire to the Lord. Uh, So the whole book of Leviticus is answering the question that we see in the Psalms, which is who may ascend in the hill of the Lord Lord, and who may dwell in his holy place? How are we supposed to live when we've got this dangerous 
holy God in our midst. And that's something, something else we don't think about, that the presence of God is dangerous, man. Yeah. When Jesus would do a miracle, they said that people would be afraid because they realized God had been among them. And that's a that's an intimidating thing. And you see this throughout the book of Numbers that the people keep getting struck down by the Lord because they weren't honoring the sacrifices. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're onto it that a sacrifice was needed. So well, then how does that apply to us? Then, that's kind of forward? that prog- you see all through Scripture. Like it's basically the progressive revelation of God saying, now this is how... I'm going to, this is how I'm going to relate to you. Okay. Now, now I'm extending this offer to you. You can be part of me, my, a relationship with me in this way. But the whole point all along is that God wants to spend time with his people. He wants to have fellowship with them and he's giving us a way to do that. And that, that culminates through Jesus. And now he says, that's why Hebrews is so awesome is because he basically says, look, before you had this law and it was a good law. It was my law. It was a perfect law. But now you have a better law, a better sanctuary, a better high priest. And he's what he's explaining in Hebrews is he's saying, now you just come and be in my presence. because Not because of you, but because of what my son has done. Yeah, because, because of what of Jesus. Jesus has done. We have access to God's presence that's actually more immediate, more accessible to us, more like constant than what is if Moses could have done, where Moses got to go into the tent tabernacle, but I don't even have to go into the tabernacle and I have an opportunity to speak to God. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole Old Old Testament, Old Covenant was building to Messiah coming. And when he did, he was the ultimate, I mean, you said Hebrews, he was the ultimate sacrifice. He was the ultimate high priest. He, his blood was sprinkled over us. He was all of that. He fulfilled all of it. And so if we needed a sacrifice to come to the Lord in prayer and seek his face, the, the New Testament is rather blunt about this. How do you expect the blood of bulls and goats to cover your sin? (laughs) <laughs> right. I, and that's a very right. that's a very modern attitude too in yeah. a lot of ways. And the answer is is it couldn't. It was a temporary measure in order to prepare for the ultimate sacrifice of the Son of God, Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus died on the cross, he opened up access to God, which is why the this uh, upper room discourse in John 14 through 17, uh, Jesus talks about a lot of things. He talks about abiding, he talks about love, he talks a little bit about unity. That kind of has been overblown in recent days, in my opinion, and I think there's, it's kind of disproportionate. But the main <laughs> thing he's talking about to me is you read that is prayer, is what's about to change when I go to my father mm-hmm. is our, our whole relationship with God is going to change. You're, you're now going to pray in my name and the father will hear you and I will send my Holy Spirit who will come and dwell within you and bring the presence of God to you. So now you're not looking for a tabernacle. God dwells within you. Right? I love to say that the New Testament takes God with us right, to God right. in us. Right. God is with us. Now God is in us. And Jesus says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And that's ro- so radical. I mean, talk about that for a second. That's, Jesus said that. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. He said it like three or four times in the upper room discourse. I mean, what, we can get at how it's done poorly in a minute, but like, what does that mean? Well, I, to me, it's the difference between like, why why would you pray if that wasn't true, right? And Because I've had times in my life where my prayer life has been weak, super weak. And I'm still, this is an area that I need to grow in is, is spiritual disciplines is this, I would say. And I'll tell you what, the, there is no, there's no, there's no calculating the difference it makes when you go from, yeah, I know, I, I really got to go sit and just be bored for 15 minutes and pray because that's what I'm supposed to do, to I have access to God unlike anything any other person has ever had before Jesus, unlike what Moses had, unlike what the prophets had, unlike all these, all these people that we look at and we're like, oh my goodness, look at Elijah. I have more access to God than Elijah. Yes, you do. More like, like provably more. And not only, so now you think about that and you're like, wait, what, what was I doing again this morning? Like, why was I not spending that time in prayer? It, it, it makes you excited because you realize how intense and like weighty this thing is and how like, how much God God was buying prayer at the price of his own son. He wanted it that bad that you would be able to have that access. Yeah. And so it really changes to me the conversation from one of like have to to one of get to. Yeah. And 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 then after get to, it's like, well, why I've really become now pretty serious about I don't want I'm not gonna let anybody in my life tell me, no, 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 no. Yes, you're supposed to pray, but you can't you can't ask him for that. 
or you yeah. can't no 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 you can't really expect that he's going to listen to that because the promises of, in scripture are so wide open and so intense yes. that I I love you my brother or sister who might even be listening to this and might say well I have some opinions about that but I I must listen to God not men that's you know that's like exactly honestly right Jesus I mean if you ask me anything in my name I will do it yeah. that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The problem is, so much of the emphasis gets put on that that last little uh-huh. tag that Jesus had. And I think that this is entirely, not misinterpreted, but misread. I'll just say this. I don't sure. think the proper emphasis of this verse is caught. When Jesus says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. People say, okay, so the Father may be glorified in the Son. So you can only pray for things that are going to glorify uh, God through the Son. Like if you if you ask for something that is not glorifying to God, He's not going to answer it. So, what it turns and is that true? Yeah, I mean obviously there are limits upon God's will is always sovereign, and there you can't go and ask God to you know God please kill my wife so that I can marry this woman across <laughs> the street that I like. And like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, duh. But when you take that now, all of a sudden this this verse in First John or in John fourteen. When Jesus is supposed to be this rousing, incredible, oh my goodness, I can pray and receive, becomes a warning yeah, you've turned the about what down. you're praying for, right? which is so backwards. When he says that the Father may be glorified in the Son, he's not referring to the things that you're asking for, glorifying God. Right. He's, he's referring, referring to, the to the fact of him answering you. Right. That is what glorifies the Father in the Son. You asking and receiving, that is what glorifies the Father in the Son. So... I don't like that when we do this. And I think it's because people are, well, people pray for things all the time and they don't receive them. But there's a million other reasons why that can be. Right. And those aren't, it's much easier to say God doesn't answer every prayer than to say you've got some kind of sin blocking your prayer. Because Peter says that, that if husbands mistreat their wives, their prayers will be hindered. Well, I thought nothing can hinder God. It's not about that. It's about you approaching God and you allowing sin to have a foothold in your life. Or if we want to get into this a little farther, Zach, and I, we could spend all day talking about prayer, so I'm trying to consolidate this now. <laughs> but, you know, well, why doesn't God answer my prayers sometimes? How about Daniel chapter 10, mm-hmm. when Daniel encounters the angel that was sent to answer his prayer? Right. And it took the angel three weeks to arrive with his answer, and even though many? he was sent immediately. Zach, why was the answer delayed? Spiritual warfare and 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 what know, is that? What do you mean by that? Well, he the, Daniel literally says that there was there was a spiritual war, you know, spirits were warring literally over the answer to that prayer. He says, I Daniel, you know, I was dispatched when you prayed three weeks ago, but I have only just been able to get to you. And he's kind of almost hurrying through the message. He says, look, 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 dude, like get all this down because I've got to go back and finish this whole slam dance I'm having with these other demons. Yeah, I was contending against the Prince of Persia. Right. The Prince of Persia withstood me, not the video game, (laughs) withstood me for three weeks. That means he had his answer and this demon got in this angel's face and said, no, you can't go any farther. And they were fighting. And he says, no one helps me except Michael. You know, your prince, the the archangel of Israel. Mm -hmm. No, no one's helping me except Michael. And then at the end of that, like you said, he goes, all right, do you understand everything I've said? For I must go back now to, to fight against the prince of Persia. It's almost like Michael, he's given the message and Michael's over here, like grappling. He's like, wrap it up, Gabriel. (laughs) (laughs) Hurry up. He got it, man. And I mean, and then the prince of Greece will come, which tells us that just like the Lord uses people in the physical world, he uses angels in the spiritual world. Right. And and that when we pray, God uses angels as the, the mediators of the answer to his to prayers. This is well established in biblical theology. And that they're struggling like we struggle. You know, an angel might say, Why doesn't he just do that? You know, if they why doesn't he just go to North Korea and preach the gospel? Didn't Jesus say go everywhere? And right. like, well, you know, maybe an angel is like, Well, listen, buddy. They they are withstood by the prince of North Korea. They can't go in, <laughs> yeah. and we have the struggle in the physical. The same thing in the spiritual. It's a war, man, and right. that's so spiritual warfare. Sin. Sometimes God's answer is not yet. Sometimes God just says no. But the the overall thrust of the New Testament is pray, receive the answer because that's what Jesus won for you on the cross. And let me tell you, if this is like, let's go to the practical now. If this is something that you struggle with, maybe you've never even, maybe you've been taught that, that no, 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 we don't pray like that. We only pray like we glorify God and then we thank him for who he is and we kind of just leave the line dead at that, right? Let me just give you a practical instruction because this is what has helped me. If you are wondering what kinds of prayers would glorify God in the Son, ask him. 
Yeah. Because okay? here's the point, right? You can you can talk to God. And it, sometimes I think we're almost like, like imagine if somebody had told my daughter over and over again, now look, here's the kinds of things you can go talk to your dad about. <laughs> you can talk to him about this and that, but don't ask him about that. That stresses him out. And definitely he's not going to answer you on that one. So don't, I, I would be a little upset because I would say, hey, ask me. I, ask me, I'll tell you. And, and if you ask me something that's weird, I'll say, sweetheart, I, no, I'm not going to. That's OK. Let's talk about something else. I'll talk to her back and forth. Yeah, prayer she, is a conversation. Exactly. She asks me weird questions all the time. And I say, oh, babe, like we're not. No, that's not how that works. And I explain things to her. Why? Because we have a two way relationship because I am a person and she is a person. And you've reminded me of this over and over. When you pray, you're talking to a person. Now it's the yes. ultimate person. That's, that's, I mean, right? It's not. Uh, it's not like, oh, Jesus is my homeboy. It doesn't hey, matter. Hey Taylor, what I I'm say. gonna let you finish. Right. I just want to say real quick. I mean, so many, <laughs> so many problems could be solved. Yeah. By uh-huh. remembering that God is is persons. Right. Like that. That just so many of the things that we do are so weird and they're so clinical and so industrial the way we yep. approach God. But yep, yep. man, God is a person. Yeah. And I'll and, just and continue. I just wanted to. What I mean by that. that is like what God is. Uh, so he's personal. He's He has said to us, I am one God, three persons. Okay. So that means that when you're speaking, you're not trying to insert the formula at one end so that the computer spits out the result. You're not trying to throw up a, a, a plea so that the universe responds. You are talking to a person who wants to listen to you, just like I'm talking to you through the mic or I'm talking to Tyler in this room. And that really helps when you go to pray because th- number one, that's that's you're speaking to God the way he wants to be spoken to. He said, talk to me like this, like I'm talking to you, right? So you got to listen to him and you're not, you're not pretending to be holier than God. And I think that's really where some of this comes down to is we think that we have kind of outfoxed God and we know the kind of way to approach him. And it, I wonder if sometimes God's a little sad about how we, how we don't take advantage of what Jesus purchased yeah. because we think that it would be presumptuous when really the presumption is the beauty of it. It's you like, get, yeah. Get, yeah. And my son is presumptuous. On <laughs> yes, <morning>. he is. <laughs> when we're, in, the, when we're yep. in my office and I'm talking to somebody or praying, he just barges in <laughs> just and like slammed the door. He slammed the door against somebody this, this Sunday and I go, we're in the middle of prayer and he goes, he sees we're praying very clearly and he goes, dad. Dad, I'm like, what, man? And he goes, do you want to come see the thing I did? Like, not right now. And so the answer was no, but <laughs> yep. he absolutely has access to do that anytime he right. wants. And you get two things. I mean, you get some people that are so afraid. It's like almost like they're concerned for God's reputation. So they yes. don't want to pray for anything yep. big. Because if God said, I, man, people pray for the sick. And that's a whole other subject. Hmm. I, if, if you're going to if, if you're gonna pray with me for a sick person, and you're going to pray something along the lines of God, you can do whatever you want. We trust that you are, are wise and, mm. and we want your will to be done. God love you. Pray that quietly in your seat. You know, but the Bible says, <laughs> ask yeah. and you will receive. It's Because yeah. what are we doing? We don't want that person to feel let down and maybe lose their salvation because they're afraid that, oh, you prayed in Jesus' name and, and no answer came. It's like, that's a, a profound lack of faith. It's like mm. to get up there and say, Lord Jesus, heal this person in Jesus name, you know, rebuke the sickness, right? And ask God to rebuke the devil. Like that's again, a whole other subject, but pray like you mean it, man. Pray like you believe that Jesus's death on the cross was enough. Yeah, go big or go but, home. I mean, you got those other people yeah. now who are, are, uh, they, they think they can manipulate God. Right. And, and they, they function. I want to be very careful how I say this because these are some of my favorite people that can fall into it. But it, where it becomes more like magic yes. or incantation. It's like these are the words you've got to use. God can't got, – nothing can stop uh, your prayers when you say these words. Like, bro, right. it's it's a person. Right. You're talking to God. The Holy Spirit is a person who dwells within you. And you've got to remember that and, and have a, a little person humility. Who's above, and a person and, who's above you. Yeah, so and so you, it's perfectly right to come with a little fear. Yeah. And even though, even as a son, right? I wouldn't like it if my daughter barged into my office. Now, every and now said, and then I've got to say not now. <laughs> right. Or, or, or I wouldn't like it if the way that my kids interacted with me treated me not like their dad, right? I love them to death. But if they started treating me like, like exactly like they treat their little brother, I would say, no, hang on now. Like, wait, wait, wait. Who do you? think you're talking to right and and so so of course there's a balance but i i do i the thing i want to leave everybody with is like look here's the easiest way to test what we're saying go talk to god because man have i have i ever i have left i have a testimony i've told you before i've left one of our prayer meetings before where you told us you've got homework to do you've got to go back and speak to god on your own and you can't go to sleep until you've heard from the lord and i i remember i went out i sat on my porch and i said okay as a person who believes all this, I believe fervently all these things I've just said, I literally said, oh, yeah, I mean, sure, 
wh- whatever. I'm tired. The, sure. It's, it's nice to know at least one person does that when I say to And to 10 do minutes, like that. I am telling you, 10 <laughs> minutes later, I was having one of the most profound spiritual experiences of my life. God spoke That's great, to That's me. Like, like he was speaking to me. Now, th- that can happen if you just show up and ask the Lord, Lord, I'm going to take you serious. I'm going to do the thing. Like if, if you're wondering about that, dude, you your porch is super close. You can do that, right? So let's. I, I want to talk about this, Tyler, like practically now. Because yeah, this let's, is the, let's this move is the into theory. some of the practical so uh, side of this my, here. My prayer, man, my, I'm hearing this. I'm excited about this. But my prayer life is just a shambles. What, what can I do practically to increase this discipline in my life, to build that muscle of prayer? Yeah, well, there's, uh, I mean, start small is the first thing I'd say. Mm. Um Many people were like, oh, I'm going to pray for three hours. And we, everybody <laughs> loves that quote from Martin Luther where he's yep. like, normally I pray two hours a day and uh, I have so much to do today. I'm going to pray three hours a day. And it's like, well, good for you, Marty. That's <laughs> that's wonderful that you, you made time for that and, you know, whatever. Okay. But we hear that and we go, okay, well, I'm going to do that. I can do at least an hour. Start with five minutes, man. Mm. That's so small. That's insultingly short. Okay. Do five minutes for 40 days. Right. Without fail, pray, you know, for 40 days. You can do more than five, but you have to do at least five. Like something like that. Get somewhere quiet. I mean, duh, right? <laughs> you know, you are you need to be quiet and you still before the Lord so that you can hear him when he speaks to you. And we've talked before about what it means to hear the voice of the Lord. But I mean, you, you got to be still. You got to be quiet. Uh, you know, a place where you can speak. I like to find a place where I can speak out loud to the Lord, uh-huh. uh, where I can actually just talk out loud or, um, you know, so you do that. Jesus told us not to do it in front of people, meaning as a big show, right? But to, to go where no one can see you, it's a secret thing. It's it's, it's, to, it's not to get brownie points from anybody else. It's just to talk to God. Right. And um, it's very good to start with... Uh, well, I mean, another practical thing. Don't do it on your bed like at 1130 at night. <laughs> I'm going to pray before I go to sleep. It's going to be a short prayer. Man, I'll tell you what. That's why guys like to do it in the morning because, okay, we're already waking up. And um, I'd say like morning, meaning get up, shower, have some breakfast, and then pray. So that Because then the day started. You're not going to go back to sleep. I've, I've, I'm have I've going to get up four more and I'm going to pray. And I get up and I go downstairs and still my PJs and that lights are still down. And I'm going to get on my on the my knees and kneel before God. And then I wake up two hours later on the floor. I mean, that <laughs> happens. So, yep. um, And you got to do it often. Mm. You got to do it often. The uh, Bible says Jesus would often withdraw to desolate places and pray. Often. That was something Jesus Christ did. So, I mean, how much more do we need to pray, right? Yeah. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. And so there's that there's that long extended time of prayer that you have just you and God, and then there are those shorter. Sometimes we call them arrow prayers. You're just firing an arrow up into heaven. But I'd say that the the benefit and the impact of your short prayers comes from the depth and the intensity of your longer prayers. And you need to be building up some some muscle right with that. And mm-hmm. you know you're going to run way more in practice than you are in the game. But you've got to be able to do it in the moment. So that's why we that's why we practice. So yeah. I mean, those are any other, any other like practical. Like we'll get to what to pray for in just a second. Any other just practical notes you have on that one? I think just, that the thing that you said about you know so many times we we overestimate when we're trying to start a new habit like that we overestimate our own strength, and we just say like oh I can pray for thirty minutes and it's like look it's I, I want to you're gonna have to humble yourself and recognize that actually you may not be able to do that. And be okay with the Lord building that slowly. It's like going to the gym. If you start throwing plates on the bar at the gym because you want to be able to lift that amount, it does you no good. You have to humble yourself and say, right now I'm the guy who can just get the bar up. And and even if you do, you're useless the next day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and this is, we're not doing this to pray today. We're doing this to pray so that in 20 years you are a person of prayer. Yeah, this is a lifelong exactly. thing, man. This So is to forever. me, it's it would be better to be a person, like you said, who was consistently doing a little bit in prayer. Because you know what's cool about this is on day 10 of your 40 days of praying for five minutes, by the time you're sh- you're showing up and you're like, oh, I, 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 it was 15 minutes and I just, I kept thinking of things that you're building and it's not going to stay there, but it does need to start there of just saying, look, we can do this. We can do five minutes, you know, and, and you're building that habit. I think starting small, I think being consistent. And I have found you, it's like we talked about some of the other disciplines. You've got to know yourself and do it in a way that is going to be enjoyable and repeatable for you. I like to walk around when I pray. If I'm oh, going yeah, to sit still and like sit and pray, I'll get distracted. If I'm like out at the lake walking around, I can pray for way longer than normal mm-hmm. because now I'm just having a talk with God and I'm my eyes are looking at the, the stuff and the trees and I'm thinking. That's and a I'm, very common recommendation is yeah. prayer walking. 
uh, because it's very think helpful it, for me. It's, it's also good for your for your heart too. <laughs> so <laughs> right, you know, do that. Uh, I I'd say now we're getting into what we pray for. Now here's another additional thing that kind of bridges the gap. Make a list before you pray. Uh huh. Like take yep the first minute of your five minutes and write some things down. And if you write, you come up with ten things that you want to pray for. I can imagine. All of us come up with 10 things. You look at problems in your life, problems in the country, problems with your friends, something you want to improve in your heart, a few things you're thankful for, a few things that you read in your scripture that you want to try to implement into your life, and you've got a very nice list of things to pray for. Now, if you've got a list, if you're praying for five minutes and you've got a list of 10 things, that's you can pray 30 seconds for each one of those. You go, right. well, this doesn't feel like hardly any time at all. Ah, there you go. You're, I don't just work, work through a list. Well, don't get so snobby, all right? right. If you're not praying at all, don't look down on, on a method of doing this, right? right? So you can do more, but just do at least that. And mm-hmm. that's a good way to remember things that you're supposed to be remembering for, and you're holding the rope for people. And um, Zach, what, I mean, what other kind of things do we pray for? I mean, um, we, I, I said problems an awful lot, and we do. That's going to be a lot of what we do, a big part a, of it, but there's, there's more. There's a book that I, I forget the name. I think it's Power of a Praying Life that I read a while back that really helped me with this. And he talks about... Um, he uses like these note cards where he'll just write a person's name on the top of a note card and he'll start putting prayer requests that he wants to continually pray for that person on the note card. And what's really fun about that is then when God answers one, you can check it off. And pretty soon you've got this note card of like 10 answered prayers for this person that you've been praying for consistently. And then the nice thing about those is you stick your note cards in your pocket. And if you're out somewhere or you're, you're just sitting for a minute, you can pull them out and you can start praying through, just flipping through what has been on your mind, your heart for these people. And I have started doing this. And man, when I'm doing this consistently, it's so cool to actually be able to tell people when you said you'd pray for them that you did pray for them. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. You movie, know what I mean? It's like that movie War Room. You've seen that one? Yeah, yeah. She uh-huh. puts it yeah. up on the wall and stuff. Really good. That's useful. I've done that before. Yep. Um, it, my old uh, office was much more conducive to that. Um, but uh, lists are helpful, man. Yeah, make a list. Yeah. Um, worship in your prayer. Taking time mm-hmm. not to ask God for anything, but uh, to use a term from Daniel Henderson: seeking God's face, not His hand. I, it's nothing wrong with seeking God's hand. That's where we can get that phrase wrong. But seek God's face first. Just start by worshiping the Lord. Pick one aspect of God and thank him for it. Think of some things that God did right for you recently and thank him for those too. Uh, and, and just worship God and say, this is who you are. And take a designate a portion of your prayer time for that. And uh, and then you move on to the other stuff. Mm-hmm. I think also, I mean, thankfulness, I said that already, but it just in general, thanking God. Confession of sin goes in this list. Mm-hmm. Keep a Keep a short account with God. That Lord, yesterday, you know, sometimes we can try to invent sins that are maybe not sins. They're just, you know, not ideal. But yesterday, Lord, I I cursed, you know, at somebody when I was driving. And I also, you know, while I was at the, while I was at the job, I made a, made a crude joke and it was not appropriate for me. And God, uh, you told us to avoid this kind of stuff. So I I, forgive me, Lord, or maybe something much more serious and you need that needs to take up a larger portion of your prayer time. But knowing that you've got that standing appointment with God every day, to confess what you've done wrong, that'll that'll keep you on the straight and narrow. <laughs> yeah. Like literally that will. And so I mean once you've done that, intercession is another thing. That's that's praying for somebody else. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and that Jesus intercedes for us. Mm-hmm. So you have the the Father or you have the Son and the Spirit interceding for you before the Father. So that is that is intertrinitarian prayer is intercession. Yeah. And so for you and me, we ought to be praying for those around us that maybe are forgetting to pray for themselves. And I mean, if you're struggling, I mean, last point that I can think of is if you're struggling with this, like praying through scripture is super helpful too. Oh yeah. Um, You, you just will, like take it. Look, you're trying to get better at reading the Bible. Okay. So we've read the Bible for the day. We've read whatever you're going to read for today. Now open that up and, and start walking through it with Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you that I see this in here, that this says something about your character and I hadn't even thought about that before. Thank you, Lord. And you know, Lord, I'm not good at doing that. And and I really need you to grow me in that area. Could you do that? Well, Lord, it says that you've made this promise here and I know somebody that isn't seeing that in their life. Could you, you know, now you're just re- repeating scripture back to the Lord and he always gives you so many ideas of what you could pray for. And it also kind of helps you to, to actually spend some time thinking about and chewing over that scripture and not just kind of reading through it. So that's a, that's a helpful one too. Yeah. And then once you've prayed for all the things on your list, whatever it may be, then is the time to sit and listen. Mm. And I mean silent. Just be silent. There, there are some that set aside silence as an extra discipline on its own, its own spiritual discipline is mm. silence. Just sit and listen. 
And what you'll begin to feel is these impressions upon your heart related to the things you've been praying for. Or a certain person will come to your mind. Or a certain situation. God will give you these things. And you, you maybe you even feel that the way you were praying for something was inappropriate. And you, you change tact a little bit. And sometimes you just feel the love of God overwhelming you. Mm-hmm. If you have the spiritual gift of tongues, this is the appropriate time to exercise that. To pray in the spirit, as Paul says. And um, that's it, it, just take the time to really hear from God. You spoke, now listen. Mm. And and budget that into your prayer time, whatever it is. I'm going to sit and listen to what God has to say. And then when prayer is done, I mean, don't end the conversation. Mm. Just keep that conversation going all day. And um, I mean, prayer, you guys, I, I like to say that if, if the Bible is the bread of life, like that's the word, right, is the is our bread, prayer is air. You, you need it. You suffocate without it. Like you, your life will not feel right until you've prayed. But you go, I mean, you get a great prayer time and bro, you're good to go mm-hmm. for, a, for a while, but wow. you shouldn't try to go for a long time. You should try to get, do it every day, multiple times a day. I mean, get to the place where prayer is such an important part of your life that, I mean, things get canceled for your prayer time and not the other way around. Yep. And people know that about you. Like, nope, you know, he's, he prays, and that's something to be known about him. They called uh, James Jesus' his brother. One of his nicknames was Camel Knees <laughs> because he spent so much time on his knees <laughs> praying that his, his le- knees became calloused. And whether that was actually what they looked like or if it was just a fun nickname, I mean, it's, it's irrelevant. Jesus prayed. James prayed. Paul prayed. All the great men of history, all the great Christians have been prayer warriors. Mm-hmm. And we need to need to cultivate that, right? Yeah, what do we say? Our, our church, we just tell, remind each other all the time, we're, we're going to do this by prayer or not at all, right? It ain't yep. worth doing if it's going to be done prayer less because you're, now you're just doing it and, and it's in the flesh. So yeah, it's very, very important. Actually, that yeah. last thing you talked about kind of leads into meditation. Yeah, let me say well one too. more thing real quick before okay. we get to that. Uh, I want to say that prayer, we were talking about personal spiritual disciplines today. You need to add corporate prayer into this too. It can't just be your own individual prayers. You've got to go to the church and pray. Uh, everyone has to complain about prayer being thrown out of schools. And yet I bet a lot of those people that complain about no prayer in schools <laughs> have never been to their church's prayer meeting before. <laughs> and many churches don't even have them anymore. And that's that's not right. So add that into the list as well. And and prayer, I'd say that that's this is in many ways the foundational spiritual discipline. You can you can do it anywhere at any time, whether or not you've got your Bible with you, not to uh, diminish the importance of the Bible, of course. So let's move on to the next one. We're going to talk about fasting now, and this is very closely related to prayer. Uh, we often just say them together, right? Prayer and fasting. And uh, the definition of this is pretty simple. It's It's abstaining from something for a spiritual purpose. And this is not the same thing as abstaining from food for health reasons. Uh, there are some that do that, intermittent fasting and all that. That This is not the same thing. This is to abstain usually from food for a time so that you can devote yourself instead to a spiritual purpose. And that's the key. It's not just not eating. It's not eating so that you can pray or participate in one of these other spiritual disciplines. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't just have to be food. We'll get to that in a minute. But it, it really does basically start there, that you're you're abstaining from food for a while and Zach, why do we do that? Well, <laughs> why do we do that? It's not just to torture yourself, and it's not a weight loss thing, right? It's it's a thing of actually... You want to do that on your own? Knock yourself out. Right. It's it, not this. <laughs> this is a thing to sharpen your spiritual senses by denying yourself of something that your flesh wants. Mm-hmm. And that might sound a little bit weird, but that's just because we're modern people. That doesn't mean that it's not all throughout Scripture, and it's not also something that throughout church history people have spoken to and said, this is a thing. This actually will draw you closer to the Lord by telling your flesh. It's like you're reminding your flesh throughout the day. You do not get to be in charge. We're going to do spiritual things and we're going to prioritize them. Yeah, we can say, I mean, we're going to start with that. I yep. mean, the, this is the, the training of the body. This, that was a term that the, uh, early church fathers and especially the monks used as, as training, mm-hmm. like training the body for godliness, which is a biblical phrase as well by teaching yourself when you're not being tempted to say no to yourself. So when you're you're hungry and you can say no to your body, the next time you are feeling lustful, you can say no to your body. Or if you are being, especially this time, tortured for the faith and they're withholding food from you, you are accustomed to telling your body no. So that when your your temper rises or when you're tempted to stay in bed and be slothful, you're, you've grown accustomed to telling your body no. And that's mm-hmm. a useful thing for 
discipleship. Yeah, 100%. And it, it, it helps deny your flesh. I think also... It, what I have found with fasting is it calls your bluff a little bit, especially like, like we'll talk about the food things, but if let's say you're you're saying, oh, I'm really struggling in prayer. Or I'm really struggling to read the word. I just don't have the time. Well, one thing I have tried is look, fast from technology for a while. And what you will mm-hmm. find is that when the time is there, you still need to deny your flesh to do what, you're, what you know to do because it's not just the denial. It's the, oh, I'm going to do this other thing instead of this thing I'm fasting from. So it helps you to build a habit that you're lacking because it's it's doing both things, the denial and the insertion of, nope, we're, we're going to do this thing. And here's the space I've carved out for it by getting rid of this other thing for a little while. Yeah. So let's talk about this this uh, practically first. We kind of did that at the end for prayer, but let's, mm-hmm. let's start with this. Fasting, and I'm specifically talking about food now. We'll get to the other stuff. But fasting from food, most people think of something called an absolute fast. An like, absolute fast is when you don't eat or drink anything. Like Jesus in the wilderness, no food, no water. Moses on Mount Sinai, no food, no water. Those are rare. And hmm. in in the Bible, when it talks about fasting, and it said they would declare a day of fasting or that they wouldn't fast, what they describe is a sundown to sundown fast. Meaning they would, you eat dinner on Monday night, you skip breakfast, lunch, and snacks all through Tuesday, and then you break your fast at dinner time again. So you're you're not having breakfast or lunch, but you're having your dinner to dinner. That's that's a typical biblical one day fast. Uh, most people in the Bible would drink water during that time. This is throughout history too, that water was okay. You're not having to completely starve yourself. But al- although I would say, I think most folks could handle skipping water too, even just for for that amount of time, it's supposed to be a little uncomfortable. Right. It's supposed to cause you to, to notice it. And you, you, I found, man, I skip lunch a lot of days because I just, I'm working and I go straight through and I don't think about it. On a day when I've determined to fast, all I can think about is lunch. Yep. It's like 9.30 <laughs> and my stomach is rumbling. I'm like, oh, when are we going to go out to Subway or Chick-fil-A? And and that's it's just crazy because it's a spiritual battle. But right. that's a normal fast. It's not, an, an absolute fast would be no food or water. And you can extend it for for longer than this. And some people will say, I'm going to do a week-long fast, meaning they'll eat their evening meal, but they won't eat anything else. Or they'll mean, I'm not going to eat any meals this week. I'm trying to tell you this because there's there can be flexibility in these things. Mm-hmm. And it, can, it sounds less intimidating when it's like, don't eat breakfast, don't eat lunch, and don't snack during the day. You can have water. And then on at the evening time, you can break your fast. I say, oh, that doesn't sound so bad. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's... It's harder than you think, but right. but it's sure. it's good to do because you're just you get in the habit of saying no to yourself a little bit. So that's that's the main technique of of fasting. You also can do something called a Daniel fast, which means fruit and vegetables and water only. That's a that's a denial of delicacies, which is I'm going to eat <laughs> you know veg you know salad with no dressing and drink water you know, for a day or a week or a month, right? That would be much easier to maintain for a long period of time. I'm not going to have soda. I'm not going to have sugar. I'm not going to have cake. I'm not going to have hearty steak or anything like that. Um, that's that's called a Daniel fast. And you can combine these however you want. There are some people that'll, they'll do long extended fasts where they won't eat anything but like a protein shake during the day. So that way they're getting the nutrients that the body needs, but it's not a pleasant experience for you. And I, I can speak from another kind of experience that... Uh, <laughs> Protein shakes do not fill you up, man. They're there to make sure that your body's okay. It right. it doesn't feel like you're eating, and or you know juice. People will, there are certain mm-hmm. kinds of juice that people will do, um, but some people just want to go straight absolute fast for you know a couple days. I mean, you you can only go so long without having anything. I wouldn't recommend doing anything longer than like a day or two if you're going to do an absolute fast. Um, but that that's kind of the basics of what we're talking about. I mean, that those things sound more manageable than what we tend to think about, right? Because we think of like the you know, the shriveled up monk that, right. you know, can't <clears throat> breathe and can't walk and his elbows are but, sticking But, you know, out. part of the reason why we think of that is because we've done a really bad job, I think, in the modern church of mocking a lot of these practices, these spiritual disciplines that people used to do and only looking at, like, the worst versions of them, right? Yeah, bro, bro just to jump in, the early church fasted every Wednesday and every mm-hmm. Friday. Yeah. Like, that, that was the accustomed practice and... That can be legalistic if you think that if you don't do that, you're not a good Christian. But the only point being, Jesus said, when you fast, and they fasted. Yeah, and I think we got to be careful of like, look, it's very easy to knock on the worst versions of somebody doing a spiritual discipline. 
when someone says read your Bible every day, somebody says, oh, well, that's just legalistic. Okay. But it's better than not reading your Bible at all and saying, I'm just, I, I need to do this, but I'm just coming up with a better method, right? Well, you should fast more. Oh, well, what? So you want to be like a, one of those weird monks that lives out in the desert? Well, maybe not. But also the weird monks fasted though. And Jesus <laughs> said we should fast, right? And, you know, same thing with prayer. People say, oh, well, it's, it's legalistic to just pray the Our Father over and over. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that's not the best way to pray but how are we praying, right? And so <laughs> yeah. we have to we have to remind ourselves, it's, not, it's very easy to just mock the worst versions of a discipline, but we're called to be disciplined. And I think in the fasting thing, it's like, look, it's been a while since I've incorporated this into my spiritual life. It's not legalism to say, let's find a version of this that I should be doing. Yes. Maybe it's not three days of absolute exactly fast. Right. Yeah, probably not, man. Check with your doctor. But it, is it going to hurt you to take a time off of lunch, like you said, for a while and just and, and allow that to focus you on your prayer life? Absolutely not. And and it, and it will help you in many ways. I think so much of that is just it's it's a I think a lot of things that we call spiritual are just bad habits that people do in every domain of life. And they bring them into the church and they just slap a fish on it. <laughs> I think when people criticize <laughs> prayer or they criticize, uh. you know, the Bible, this is the same kind of person, the same kind of complaint you hear from an out of shape person complaining about people that exercise. <laughs> like, yeah. why would you do that to your body? Like that's, it's not natural to go out and you know, you're, 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 you're just insecure with what you look like. And I'm, I'm confident I'm happy or people that go out and make a lot of money and they want to create, well, you, I, I would never do that anyway. Cause I, I'd take time for my family and there's always an excuse for something. And then we come into the church and you've got some really sounding legitimate biblical excuses about legalism and such and and but right. it's it's the same thing it's just that uh-huh. same i'm not doing it and i don't like the the reproach that this is to me when yeah. you step out and do it no that's a great yeah b- be careful of that you know don't l- let's remember what the definition we talked about this last I mean, time I mean, can remember, we just say period don't ever criticize somebody's spiritual life if they're a, if they're a brother in christ i think that's fair yeah i can't i'm trying to think of a reason why but yeah like look look let's remember that the As definition, a default position mm-hmm. anyway and that includes i would say that includes extending being charitable to other people who are from a different like background or domination than you unless you have a specific reason right a doctrinal or theological reason you don't just criticize how they're trying to follow the lord because it doesn't it doesn't look like you do it like come on now like these are people that are trying they're, they're passionately following the lord and if you know they love jesus and they're straight biblically and like they've got it together then look you don't just say oh i don't like that's weird we don't do it that way yeah but, i mean here's an know. example for you i mean i am not a catholic no i never will be right and i do not encourage anybody else to be correct but let's look at something here lent oh yeah oh, every, uh-huh. every year 40 days leading up to easter yep they take they fast from something for 40 days if you're going to tell me that if you if you don't do this, you're not going to heaven or that it's a sin not to do this, then yes, that's legalism. However, man, taking 40 days every year to fast from something right. is an admirable thing to do. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm not saying that you should then go out and do it, but it's like, well, then what's your plan, chief? Right. <laughs> like, okay, well, how are you fasting? Mm-hmm. And, and there's there's something to be said for, uh, you know, I think, did we talk last time about uh, maybe... I think we talked about Benedict last time who saw the uh, yes, how did. the Muslims yeah. prayed five yep. times a day. And he's Benedict like, shoot, if some pagan can do this, then mm-hmm. I can do it. That's exactly you know, right. And that's not saying let's do it just like them, but it's allowing yourself to be motivated to do more for the Lord than somebody else would. So a plan is not legalism. And yeah, fasting's <laughs> kind of become a lost discipline in the church. Yes, it and, has, yeah. and like, just no, it's not that even, I don't know anybody that's anti-fasting other than like that, uh, you know, the bad attitude we just described. We just don't talk but about it. We just, yeah, we just don't do it. Right. I, I think somebody who does a great job of talking about fasting a lot, although he's not with us anymore, is Jerry Falwell. He, I mean, he hmm. would talk about the most, the key moments of his life were when he said, I'm going to take 40 days and fast. And he would take like, uh, you read his books. He talks about, he would get with his doctor and they would get like a, I think he did like a juice thing that he would take every day and he would take vitamins and stuff to make sure that he wasn't, uh, you gonna know, die. yeah, he wasn't going to die. <laughs> I mean, you got to be careful, but because that's not honoring to the Lord either. It's not about buffeting the body. It's about strengthening your spirit. Right. But he says, every time I did that, God would just do some remarkable transformative thing in my whole life. Mm-hmm. And I think you can see the sovereignty of God in that, that God was drawing him into those moments. Yeah. So yeah, fasting, man, we, we got to do it. We got to do it more. You, you got to fast and, and take the time. Why not? Most of us have Wednesday night church. If you're in Calvary Chapel anyway, why not say Wednesdays I fast? I don't fast until after I don't break my fast until after I get home from church and then you can eat. Why why not do that? Hmm. Just say I know I'm going to church tonight to hear from God, so this week I'm going to 
I'm going to say no to my flesh so that when I come into the house of the Lord, I've said, God, I've already dedicated this whole day to you. It's not a bad habit to introduce, in my right. opinion. And if I'll just I'll just encourage you, if, if like me, you, maybe you're like me and you say, oh, I don't know, man, that sounds a little extreme. I just say, look, good. Like, look, we, we yeah, extreme is what we want, right? Haven't we said for years, like, oh, the, the, our church is so l- lukewarm and so lackadaisical. Good. Then when we take the steps that are needed to, to put <laughs> yeah. that fire back in us, we shouldn't be surprised if they're a little uncomfortable because we've been comfortable. Yeah. Right? And this is, this is uh, talking. I talked a minute ago about uh, the different ways that people fast. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm diabetic. I can't, I can't fast. I get that. God yeah, gets yeah. that. Right. Sure. Or I'm whatever your, your issue is. That's a fine. <laughs> That's not like Mario. Doesn't that's a fine. That's a fine. <laughs> <laughs> we have a different it's a fast. <laughs> okay. So that's fine. Right. What can you do so that it starts to sting? That's uh, that's yeah. the threshold that you're trying to go for. And, you know, Paul talks about, you know, beating up the body has an appearance of godliness, but it, uh, you know, it doesn't serve to destroy and defeat the flesh. Mm-hmm. But you, you do need to, you do need to feel it a little bit and you need to replace it with with spiritual things. If you're going to skip lunch on your fasting day, don't just skip lunch. Take your lunch hour and pray. Right. Take your Bible with you. Go on a prayer walk. Do one of these other things we've discussed. You know, if you're going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to eat breakfast today. Okay, you better spend that time in the morning seeking the Lord. Otherwise, you're just going to get grouchy. Right. Well, I didn't get anything out of it. Well, of course you didn't. Right. You just <laughs> of course got mad, you didn't. Yeah. You, you got to replace it with something right. else. You're making time. You're teaching yourself to say no. And fasting is a very important. If you're praying for something... That is so serious. This was they would do this a lot in the Bible. They would fast out of grief for something that they had done. Um, you know, if some terrible law is passed in the in the U.S., for example, and you're just shocked by it, man, take a couple of days and fast and pray and just lament and and show the Lord that you're 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 serious about mm-hmm. this. Or if you've got a big request, you've got one of your kids that's walked away from the Lord and is about to make some terrible, drastic mistake, man, drop everything and and fast. Like just no, we're not doing anything. We're fasting and praying, and I got. I'm going to take a personal day from work, and I'm going to spend this whole day in prayer and fasting. I'm not going to eat. I mean, that's that's how we fight, man. That's what the Bible yeah. shows us to do. That's yep. it. At the very least, it is exemplified. Luke five thirty five says the days are coming when the bridegroom will be taken away, and then they will fast in those days. Hmm. We're living in those days, right? And as we've hit on a couple times here, Zach, you can fast from more than just food. Can you not? Yeah. Do you want to give us some examples of that? Yeah, some good alternative stuff are like, you know, technology fasts, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in this day and age where it feels like for some of us, that's almost as important to us as food, right? So, hey, take it away from for a little bit. Let your spirit get antsy and and get get through that first period of what I, what I, I'm not, I'm not online. I'm not doing this. And and once you push through that, fine, use that time, use that space to spend time with the Lord. Even unbelievers will do that. I'm going to take a month. I'm going to stay off of Facebook. It's like, yeah, because there's a benefit to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so do that. Um, I, you know, if the, if there's an activity in your life that's you feel you feel start to push out spiritual things, fast from that. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, for for I think technology just dominates our mind space so much that we don't think about other things. But look, if you're if you know that you're spending five hours every Sunday on, on football in some way. And I'm not, I'm not just knocking yeah. on football. Like I love sports, right? But if you, if, if, if that's taking up that much space, tell yourself, you know what, but this month we're going to go ahead and it's not forever, but it's this month. Mm-hmm. We're going to, we're going to take this time and ask the Lord to see. And I would also say that there are times if I have a habit in my life, it's not a sinful habit, right? It's not, it's not, it's not, I know it's, this is not, you don't fast from a sin, right? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take a break from this sin. No, no, no. No, you, you stop sinning. Right. You, you fast <laughs> from something that, look, there's no problem here. This is a liberty I have, but I'm going to pause from it because I want, I want to see if the Lord is going to meet me in a unique way when I do that. Like, let's take the example of like, maybe, I don't know, what's a good example? We're talking about technology. Oh, my, my family and I, uh, a couple times a year, and I think this next year we might want to formalize it actually and, and like schedule it ahead of time. But um, we'll fast from all media. Right. So that for us, that is TV, movies also, video games, uh, non-Christian books, uh, secular music, and even Christian music that is not worship music specifically. Mm. And everything is off. Phones, apps, social media. I don't have social media, but I mean, my wife does. And we just take it all a break. And I'll tell you guys, they are some of our favorite times as a family. Hmm. My eight-year-old and six-year-old sons will say, when are we going to do another media fast? (laughs) Like, friend, you can do it right now if you want. I mean, (laughs) 
uh, because it's, you know, they're kids and they like watching TV and so do we, and we don't have a problem with those things, but it's every now and then it's like, we want to make sure this does not have a hold on yep. us. It's a good I, reset I mean, of your habits yes. so that you then check in and you say, well, wait a second. I was spending that much time on yeah. that. Or do wow. I still want to do this? That's yeah. another thing. Do yep. I still want to exactly have this be am i going to add this back life? in in the same way sometimes when i've fasted from something i later on i say well wait a second okay maybe the lord is going to give me this back but we're not going to do it in the same way we, I, yeah. i've discovered that this allowed me to do something differently with the lord so now i'm going to put up an, a different way of acting with it when we bring it back in so it's just it's a yeah. good way to kind of i don't know check the oil level in the engine spiritually a little bit every yeah. once in a while i've got a i've got a couple stories on that one so the first one is when i was in high school and um, I was in freshman year of high school and they had this thing where you, they would send your grades home to the parents and um, they sent it to my email address <laughs> and I had had some grades I didn't want my folks to see. So I didn't show them and I allowed them to continue to believe that they hadn't received them yet until finally <laughs> they called the school. I think that's what it was. And they found out that I had received the grades so lie number one and then the second bit was oh yeah and he's been getting bad grades too like so it was a, a whole kerfuffle in my house <laughs> and so i was a big gamer at the time and so my nintendo gamecube and all other paraphernalia were taken away from me unplugged from the television and put up in the closet you can have this back someday and it ended up being it was at least a month it was a long time mm. so I, I had straight up lied and I hadn't been doing good in school. So, uh, but I'll tell you what happened. After a while, I stopped missing it. I started just kind of doing other things, going outside more, which I mean, I was never a recluse, but I was, was doing more of that and right. reading and, and all those. And one day my uh, parents called me in and I remember they were both sitting at the table and like, hey, so how you doing? I'm doing good. And so we looked at your grades. Your grades look really good. Oh, thank you. I said, so, so uh, you haven't played your, your GameCube in a long time. Like, yeah, no. And they go, well, you know what? you can go get it out. You can go get it out and play it right now. And I think they expected me to just, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. and run back and go get it. But I was 14, but I go, okay, thank you. And I didn't get it out right then. I did. I mean, like probably the next day or so, but I remember having a, a little moment in my young freshman heart where I'm like, <laughs> wow, that really broke me of this thing. Mm -hmm. Just not doing it for this long. I broke my habit from it. And but the reason I don't do social media is because I, I always thought it was kind of lame anyway, to be honest with you, but um, I just didn't really get it. But then uh, when I was in college, my college pastor, Mike Massey, who is a pastor in Pennsylvania now, I think, and he said, uh, why don't you guys take a break from social media for a week? Take It was just Facebook really at that point. Take a, take a break from Facebook. I said, all right. And I took one week off and ended up taking two weeks off. And I think it was almost three weeks off before I got back on and I was on for a couple of days and then it was so much, not nearly as regulated then as it was now. And somebody sent me uh, some pornographic thing. And so I was like, you know what? That's it. It's over. And so I deleted my account and I've not been back since hmm. because what the fast did was it allowed me to see, I don't know that I, do I really want to introduce this back into my life? And then I kind of did. And I immediately was hit with something that was negative And I was just like, you know what? No, I don't. And so that's what, that's what fasting from something can yeah. do to you. Very healthy practice for for us and i think probably one of all the disciplines like we said kind of one of the forgotten ones um we all have one of these in our lives where we're like oh yeah that's right we do that <laughs> and, and uh supposed to right yeah and so but yeah very very helpful and, and i think especially if you feel like your life is cluttered if you feel like your life is so you don't have a moment to take a break or to take a breath fasting is a good yeah. discipline to help you insert that back in you've got things in your life that you don't even like you know, yeah. you, you know, you ever, yep. it's like when you, yeah. why ever, am I doing this? You ever go through a drive through man, mm -hmm. and you finish your, your food and you're like, I don't even like that. Right. Like I, I remember I, I hit a point a while back where I realized I didn't really like French fries. Like I'll, I'll, you know, they're fine, but I wasn't just like, Oh yeah. And so I was like, why do I keep getting French fries at the, you know, I don't even like them that much. Or, you know, you step back and you know, I don't even like Facebook. You ever feel better when you come off of Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, <laughs> I mean, whatever your thing is, or if watching five hours of Fox news or CNN in the evening is just making you grouchy and grumpy, man, just take a break. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I'll miss some important new, man, if we go to war, you'll find out about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, if the, if, the, if the Rona comes back, you'll find out about yep. it, I promise. And you'll what will happen when you do that, when you skip news for a while, uh, you will realize how insignificant these stupid news cycles are because yep. you'll miss two or three of them. You'll come back in the middle of one and you'll come in cold and you go, really, this is what we're talking about yep. now? 
and and you'll see how your yeah. life outside of it you were you were happily you walking were fine. around <laughs> yep you were happily walking around living with Jesus not anxious not angry not stressed out and you didn't know about this thing and it didn't kill you didn't kill anybody else that you knew and it's a good it's a good resetter of yeah of your heart and your mind yeah i forgot even about that news is an important one I yeah think i do that from time to time and sometimes i need to do it harder than others and um, yeah, so anytime you get that kind of sick feeling, like, why do I, why do you even do this? I mean, just, right. yeah, take a break from it and see what happens. And so, uh, you guys, and, and before we move on, even good things, guys, like it, there are some things that mm. people enjoy that are not tempting, just, they're just not tempting, but they become a point of distraction and obsession for you. So if you love to draw, for example, you know, that's nothing wrong with that at all. Take a break fast from it because you love it. Whatever the thing in your life that you love the most, take a break from it. The Bible, even in 1 Corinthians 7, talks about husbands and wives taking breaks from sex from each other. It does. In fact, he says that's the only reason you should be abstaining from sex in your marriage is by fasting by mutual consent together. So, you know, someone doesn't get to say, oh, honey, we can't have sex for the next two years because I'm fasting. Like, no, no. <laughs> mutual consent, right, Paul right, talks right. about. And for the purpose, it says of what? It says mutual consent, not just, hey, we're going to take a break from sex because because <laughs> it's it's no it's it's to seek the lord to seek the lord and and man we boy doesn't that for some of us we're like what no that can't no look it's in the bible yeah. the lord says look, something 7. so important so vital to your relationship so that the lord is a fan of but yet well taking this break could help sharpen your spiritual senses to to seek the lord so if, if the lord can ask us to do that then surely there's all these other things in our lives that are much less important than yeah. that a- anything that you're starting to build an identity Ooh, good about good yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you uh-huh. know, maybe if you if you have the Christian liberty to drink, mm. take a break every once in a while, just yeah. to can just to make sure. Are you really able to say no to this? And if you don't know what to do with it without it, then you're in trouble. I mean, mm-hmm. cigarettes, same same thing. Coffee, you know, coffee. Yeah, shoot, take a break from coffee for a while. Yep. Uh, I know a lot of friends that you know something about anime. People only get obsessed. You're either obsessed or you're not interested. <laughs> Zero or Take 100. a break for a while. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know what I do with myself. Then that's why you need to fast right. from it, man. Right. Or or college football or whatever your thing is. You know, so, especially things that could potentially be addictive. You know, if you like mm-hmm. to, you know, if you like to bet on sports games or something, take a break yeah. for a while. Fast for a couple big games because you know what, man, that stuff can kill you. And you want to make sure that it doesn't have a hold over you. Right. I mean, I could add to that junk food and, and things that are terrible for you. I've already hit on that. Uh, taking breaks, fasting, and and instead seeking the Lord. Mm. If there's something spiritual that you're trying to implement into your life, but you don't have time for it, you've got to find a way to break it off. Okay, fine. So I'm going to say no to some other things in order to make sure that the big rock goes in first. Right. And then I'm going to try to put everything else back in. And some stuff you'll do it and you'll realize... I really don't need this. Doesn't fit yep. anymore. Right. So that's fasting. Do it, guys, and do it do it regularly. Teach yourself to say no to yourself. Mm-hmm. And uh I say parents lead your families in that. Husbands lead your wives in that. Pastors lead your churches in in that. And uh, if you can't say no to yourself, you're going to fall for every single temptation. 100%. So fasting. Okay, so let's get on to the next one. And this will, might be the last one that we do. We'll get to, uh, I wanted to do four today, but I think we'll just do three. And here's one that, you know, fasting is one of those that, I don't know anybody who's anti-fasting, mm. but we just kind of forget about it. We go, oh yeah. <laughs> and prayer is one that everybody is in agreement on. This next one is one that I think most Christians understand is important, but I think it's a bad rap. So this is meditation. Zach, why do you think Christians feel weird when they hear that word meditation? It's a biblical word, but why do we feel weird when we hear it? Well, because we sometimes listen more to what's happening outside than inside. And so if you look out in the culture, anytime anybody says meditation, they're talking about a Eastern, and I mean, Christian, Christianity came from the Middle East, right? So, I, But I mean, Eastern, like Far yeah, East. Christianity is a, is a Middleist. <laughs> right, right. We're talking middle, about... An, middle Stern an religion. <laughs> Eastern religion, like a, a... We're talking about, you know, transcendental meditation or... Buddhism. Buddhism. Zen, yeah, um, um, or any of those... Hinduism. Yes, any of those kind of constellation of different traditions. New where, Age. And their meditation, Christians rightfully recognize that is not a thing we're into. We don't like that. That's bad. It's dangerous. We don't do it. Okay. But unfortunately, because sometimes the way that those other false religions practice this thing can look similar to something that we're called to do, we say, oh, I don't know. 
I wouldn't want to accidentally do a Hindu, so I'm gonna, <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna skip. I don't. Meditation is probably scary. Let's not do don't, that. Do, don't you love in old books like they they spell spell Hindu H I N D O O? Yeah, it's old British. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's how you pronounced it just <laughs> right. now. A Hindu, a Hindu, a Hindu. Uh, but here's the thing: we can't afford to do that, right? Because if we start that process of well, anything that looks like it might be somebody else is bad. Look, Satan is very good at counterfeiting, and he counterfeits everything. Other religions pray. Yes, other that's religions exactly have right. a holy book they read. If we're just going to quit things because sa- there's satanic counterfeits of them, we won't end up doing anything that Jesus called us to do. No. We, <laughs> yeah. we, we can't yeah, do that. We can't do that. So we've got to reclaim these things, and we do that not by looking at other religions and, you know, they have some helpful things to say. No, no, no. We go back to scripture and we say, but what did scripture say about meditation? Right? And, and yes. we find that there's a lot of biblical guidelines about what Christian meditation looks like. And we find actually that we're. We are missing out on something if we let go of this just because, and here, here's the thing, Christian, don't let go of a spiritual, disim- a spiritual discipline because of what you're afraid some other Christian will say to you if <laughs> yeah, they see you doing not. it, right? Yeah. Oh, well, some, this, this other Christian I know that's really worried about this stuff, they're going to think I'm a this. Okay. Are you more worried about what the Lord is going to think about the state of your spirit than you are, uh, you know, what this person is going to think about what you're doing? Because that's how it needs to be. You need to be doing these things as unto the Lord, not as unto men. Right. That's that's exactly the case. And then here's the thing. If you know God, if you know God well and you're a Christian, you've probably done a fair bit of meditating, even if you don't realize what this is. Uh, That's a good point. So here's a Bible verse for you. Psalm 143, verse 5. Great triple Hebrew parallelism here. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. So in the middle, we have meditate. But in parallel with that word is the word remember and ponder. When it says that Mary pondered these things in her heart, that's very similar to the idea of meditation. It's to think on. You could say meditation is focused thinking. It's the act of sitting still before the Lord in silence as best as you can and just thinking on him and on his word. It's active. That This is the difference between Eastern and Western meditation. Right. I'm going to exaggerate the differences here, but I'm, I think most of us are dealing with an exaggerated version of that anyhow. Yes. So Eastern meditation is all about emptying yourself, mm-hmm. being silent, and just kind of like in a, in a kind of a null state. Right. Or like, you know, this repetitious, like you have a mantra, you just say things over and over and over again. That is, Bible, first of all, calls that last one vain repetition. They said they think they will be heard because of their many words. And we are not seeking to empty our minds as Christians. We are seeking to fill our minds. It's the exact opposite. It is not passive meditation, letting the universe speak. No, it is active. I know what is right. I know what is true. This is informed by your Bible study. Yep. And I am going to think upon that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you start by just meditating on scripture, Zach. I mean, if yep. you have a pretty, either a dicey one that you're not quite sure what it means or one that you know what it means and it's just kind of profound and blowing your mind, I mean, you need to meditate on these. My my, I did some devotions recently where I took one beatitude mm. and meditated on it. And man, I mean, like hours, I mean, hours for one, where is it blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're going to sit and think about that. Right. And and think about it and unpack it. And what does it mean? What is each word saying? What is it all coming together to say? And this is not trying to discover the truth. It's pretty clear what it means. But like the significance of it for your own life and, and related to the rest of scripture, it's it's very much focused thinking on something. That's, a good That's my favorite it. definition. And I that. think sometimes if we struggle with it, because you'll hear people say, oh, the Bible is just so complicated. So look. Friend, if you're only if you're going to limit your thinking on any individual passage to 30 seconds, then look, you, you, the Bible, not only the Bible, but any book will escape you. Or just to get your nugget for the day. A hundred percent. And 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 we're weak in meditation when that's what we're doing is we're reading, like you said, exactly. Where's my little promise that I can extract and go carry around for the day? I understand why we do that, but the, but meditation teaches us that all of scripture has something to say to me. Maybe it doesn't have something, you know, directly applied to me in a way that encourages me today or that, you know, solves my problem that I'm bringing to the Lord, but it has something to say. So yeah, you, like you said, and that doesn't mean you're sitting there for four hours and all you're doing is thinking on that beatitude. It means as you're walking through the day, you're, you're some people will, they'll write one verse on a card 
and they'll pull that card out multiple times a day and look at it and say, mm. oh, that's right. Okay, well, what is, you know, and they'll remind themselves of it. Some people will, there's some really cool musical artists who put scripture into songs and you're just listening to that and man, it's getting hammered into your mind until now you're, you're, you're singing along to the tune of it. And pretty soon you've, that song has been on five times and you're thinking all the time about this verse and like, yeah, what does that mean? And, yeah. and it, it's a way, like you said, it's focused thinking. And so where now the problem that we find is sometimes in our life, in our, in our world, we might have to do a little bit of emptying to get to a place where we can fill it up. Yes. Right. So this is the difference. This is the difference. So we're, you know, um, especially Zen Buddhism is all about, you know, it's, I mean, if you ever want to know what Zen Buddhism is, think of Yoda from Star Wars. Exactly. Right. You know, luminous beings, not this crude matter, right. Is right. that you are part of everything and it's, it's learning to empty your mind so that you're not thinking mm-hmm. and you just sense your connection to the world around you. That is not what this is. Right. It, focused thinking is is you need to remove things that are distracting from you. Mm-hmm. You need to remove things that are in in consonant with what the scripture says, you know, and sometimes that becomes your point of meditation if there's something you can't let go of. But even that is active. Right. You are trying it's yeah yeah, if you're trying to clean out your closet, you have to take the stuff out first. Right. But getting it out is not the goal. It's step one as you're trying to fill it with the right things, right. you know? So organizing it and, and yes. systematizing it so that you can look does at it. Does this all. belong here? Right. You know, does what's that stupid show from a few years ago? Does this one spark joy? Right, right, right. <laughs> well, and and this is why I don't even remember the meme. I never even watched the show. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why meditation is one of the spiritual disciplines that's so important if you struggle with anxiety, is because what you're doing is you're yes. training your mind to work correctly to work the way the Lord wants it to, which is you're teaching yourself both the I am not going to allow this thought to dominate my mind. I'm going to say, no, nope, that's not from the Lord. That disagrees with scripture. That's not who the what the Lord says about me. That's not what the Lord says about himself. I'm going right. to remove that. Training right? your brain a little bit. Right. And But you're not just, if you've ever tried those other kinds of meditation for anxiety, you'll find that you just become anxious because now you've just tried to block out all the thoughts and sit there with nothing, which means all the thoughts are going to come back. It's inevitable. And yeah. so what instead you're doing is you're saying, okay, I, I struggle with fear. All right. So every time I have a fearful thought, I'm going to say, nope, that's not what the Lord says. And then I'm going to say, here's what the Lord says. The Lord says these five verses I've been working on memorizing. And the Lord says this worship song that reminds me of his character. And and here's here's this passage that I'm going to read every time I think about this. And here's a prayer I've written down that reminds me what the Lord said, right? You, yes. You're filling yourself back up it, with It is things. very hard to apply scripture that you have not meditated upon deeply. You can almost Ooh, say in that's one a, that's in, a good point. Yeah, in yeah, one yeah, yeah. sense sitting and listening to a preacher talk is is all I it's going to sound so corny, but it it's almost like uh congregational meditation. The pastor has taken his time to study it, think through hmm. what to say, sure. and now we're all going to listen to this together. And it's it's pretty much learning to do some of that, pieces of that by yourself which is why it has to be still and quiet. I mean, how many times in the Bible does it say, be still? Mm-hmm. And you're talking about anxiety. Well, before I move on to that, I mean, it's impo- It's very difficult to apply scripture that you haven't meditated upon. It is it is almost impossible as a pastor. When I'm talking to somebody who is in some kind of spiritual distress and I tell them what the word says, if they just can't receive it, mm-hmm. sometimes we hit a wall. Yeah. Where it's, you know, when someone says, well, God has abandoned me. I said, God has not abandoned you. Look at what all these different things say. This is what the word says. And and also, let's look at your life. This isn't what's exactly happening. Right. If the person then goes, no, but no, God has abandoned me. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing else I can really do for you at that point other than say it again. If you haven't really sat and thought about, you know, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Right. And I shall not want. Like, even just that, I mean, slow down. The Lord who are we talking about? We're talking about the Lord, the creator, the maker of heaven and earth is my shepherd. Oh man, you, 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 when you think through that, then when the pastor, you say, God is a bed and he said, no, the Lord is your shepherd. You go, that's right. Yes, that right, is right. right. And if it's the first time you're hearing that is in the moment, it's going to be very difficult. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't think we're very good as a society at focused thinking about anything. I yeah, just think, I period. I don't think that's a shocking Stillness opinion. is not our thing. <laughs> right. Quietness is not our thing. I think rapid uh, attention shifts yep. are, are our thing. Uh, I think that in some ways, we're g- like, we'll listen to four-hour podcasts or walk, watch like a 10-hour TV show. So in one sense, there we do have the ability to sit still for these things. But I think there's also this 
twitchiness mm-hmm. that we have. And the more twitchy you are, <laughs> you know, that's a theological term right there, right, twitchy. Right. Then the more anxious and the more stressed you're going to be. Yep. I, I think you even hear, you hear intellectuals sometimes even talking. And it's like, you haven't thought through this mm-hmm. enough. You haven't thought through this. Like, that's why you see a lot of these... Um, you know, a lot of YouTubers will do man on the street interviews where they ask somebody a, a profound question and they've got a strong opinion on it. And they ask them like two or three focused questions and it all just <laughs> falls apart because mm-hmm. you haven't thought through this. Right. And, and I, I we see that. Am I am I wrong, Zach? Do no, we see that? 100%. Kind and of I, in society in general? And I think that that's one of, in society in general and we see it within the church. Unfortunately, I think we, and we all know, I'm not like trying to be mean or knock on anybody. I think we all know, man, I I love Jesus. I'm following Jesus, but I don't, I need to see some depth in my life. I think we all feel that, right? That we know we're a culture of shallowness and we're maybe that way in the church. And look, if, if you feel that, I meditation is for you. Like this is what the Lord wants. He wants you to spend this focused time so immersed in what he says, chewing on it, thinking about it, marinating in it, that when the enemy throws one of those little fiery darts over the wall, instead of that causing this huge burn up in your life for six hours, now it's like, oh yeah, that doesn't fit with this that I've just spent an hour steeping in. Nah, I'm going to brush that off. And and I will, I will tell you personally that this Not only does this bear fruit, but it bears long-term fruit because you spend this time to where now, even years later, the fact that you have meditated on something, it gets so buried in there that it actually continues to to produce dividends. And I think we, we really overrate our ability to make changes because things change fast on your phone doesn't mean that you're changing, yeah. <laughs> right? And, and so you need to be patient with yourself and know that God has prescribed this way of you changing, which includes, I mean, it takes a long time to meditate and yeah. you should you should be as patient as the Lord is intending yeah. you to be. And it's interesting how, uh, or just draw attention to the fact that uh, Christian meditation is very much in line with um, certain forms of critical thinking and of uh, even even... I don't want to, it's not science like in a lab, but like that wisdom philosophical thought. Sure. Because it's got a spiritual component to it. But I mean, that is a very spiritual thing. And it's, you know, it's kind of funny. A lot of times the guys you hear shouting, we don't have critical thinking and logic in our, these are some of them like shallow, (laughs) dopiest guys. And it's like, because, you know, that's not critical thinking. This answer that I looked up is critical thinking. (laughs) It's like, homeboy it's critical thinking is not atheism it's right. being able to think through things and christians we're not just critical thinking we're spiritually thinking we mm. have all the facts that we've gathered from our study in the word we've personalized them through the meditate or the the through prayer right. and then in meditation we're, we're really applying them and, and thinking through our own situations and you've you've got to do this and sometimes writing things down is helpful for meditation yes, i one of the best advantages I gained from going to Bible college, which is not for everybody. But one of the things I gained was it forced me to write papers on stuff that I already had opinions on. And I very rarely changed what I thought because I had, I had studied these things before and sure. I had been good, well-trained at my church and had read the Bible a couple times and had been read theology for fun for years. So I knew what I believed, but having to actually sit down and systematically present it and defend it and cite it and all that really straightened out my thinking on a lot of this. Like Mm -hmm. it didn't change my mind, but it sharpened my mind. Like this is why, and I know this, and that's what we do with the scripture. And some of this stuff, guys, I mean, it is spiritual. Like I I mentioned the Beatitudes and Psalm 23 and and, and some of these things the Bible says, there's spiritual depth to them. And you, you almost get that Aslan feeling when you read them. Where it's like, oh man, there's something to this. Mm-hmm. You know, you read a story in the scripture, there's something here. And I don't know what it is right away. Well, take the time. Schedule some time. This is when I'm going to remember and meditate and ponder who God is and what he's done. And what what is Paul getting at here? Mm-hmm. Or what is what is Isaiah revealing through this? And this story, I feel like I get the gist of it, but there might be more to this. And when you do that, you are, you are inoculated against people that sound and speak authoritatively. <laughs> But yeah. they really, I mean, there are a lot of people, especially people that are used to being teachers or used to being like public speakers and stuff. They have their area of expertise, but they'll talk about other things like religion with the same authority in their voice that makes it sound like they've done all their, their homework on it. And right. in reality, they haven't. Right. And But if you've meditated on the word, then you're, you're prepared for these kinds of things. So Zach, how is Christian meditation different from like mindfulness practice or 
any of these other things that we hear about, like the the modern meditation things that people tell you about getting into? Well, okay, I, I'm not an expert on mindfulness because it's not a thing that I do. But um, my understanding of what mindfulness teaches is a lot of inward and personal focus on your thoughts. What What is my mind doing? My mind's doing this. Okay, that's what my mind's doing. Okay, I'm thinking about this. That's what... It, you know, trying words, to be a, in the moment, and it's an inward say. focus on your. It's looking to yourself and self focusing, and I, I personally think that's actually very bad for you spiritually. What what you know? Well, what what a miserable subject yourself. Yeah, I already know about me. You what think Christ, about it long enough. You're like, I don't like this. Exactly. What Christian <laughs> meditation does is it says, no, let's think on what it says think on these things yeah, right whatever is true him. whatever is lovely all that and you're thinking on god well, let's pull that up and read that you yeah yeah, yeah. so so up. so i think to me the difference is like look when you're meditating as a christian i don't man like you said i i spend hours out 40 hours a week and more you know at my job thinking about things that stress me out i spend basically every waking hour of the day with my own living with my own thoughts of like this is going on and that's going on and, and whatever Christian meditation is refocusing your mind on God. Yes. And and I think th- that's why it's so on important. On the most important thing. Right. And that's why it's so important is that, look, proportionally, you're going to be spending a lot of your time with your mind focused on other things. And if you don't do this, if you say, ah, oh, meditation, that sounds weird. I'm not going to do that. You're basically saying, instead, I'm going to allow my mind to rule itself and to respond to whatever stimuluses I encounter in the world. I just don't think that the, the 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 end result of that can only be bad for you spiritually. If you're not going to spend any time at all focused, intensely paying attention to the Lord with your mind, right. then I think you're going to see what we see for a lot of people, which is you're going to be anxious and upset and angry and all that stuff. Yeah, and a lot of these you know social media guys, like these, especially fitness guys or entrepreneurial guys, it's like you know <laughs> you're gonna you know, we're going to do your mindfulness. We're going to manifest some stuff. Like that's pagan. That is right, pagan, right. For sure, you guys. For sure. That that is, you know, not that these people are bad people. They're but they don't know God. Right. And I don't like seeing these terms creep into the Christian lexicon. We have our own tradition mm. that goes way farther back than this stupid stuff. Right. And I think the unfortunate thing is so many Christians are ignorant of their own tradition. Right. They know all kinds of things about yoga and you know, Enneagrams and all this other stuff. Sure. But when it comes to like the history of Christian thought and the Christian spirituality, and they don't know about any of these great men of God that have gone ahead of us. Ignorant and of our own tradition and also, also hungry though for the things that God gave us, whether we know it or not, right? Yeah. So you in your mind, you know, I am strung out mentally. This can't be right. I can't be like this. And then someone comes and brings you yoga and you, or, and I'm not, no, stretching is not bad. I mean, like the, well, I mean, hold the, on though. Let me get on that. Cause there's right. yoga and there's yoga. Exactly. Yoga That's is I mean. a religious thing right. in, in Hindu cultures. Like they do this to align them, their bodies with the physical world because they believe that everything is right. connected. And so that's why they they say things like, you know, empty your mind, feel the energy, feel the chakra. Like those are heathen those things. Those are spiritual things. Now, if, you know, I, I also see a lot of, you know, lunkheads at the gym <laughs> who do yoga stretching in order, like that. that's that's one thing. And may, there's there's liberty, I think, involved right. in there. But, you know, if you're in one of these places where they're playing sitar music and they're telling you, you know, to feel your connection with the earth and the ground. Right. It's like, you you don't want anything to do but with that. But what I mean by that is, though, the reason why that's attractive to Christians or any kind of the, these other spiritual practices is because they're, they're meant to fill, Satan is using those to fill a hole in your spirit that God knows is there. And if you've told yourself, oh, well, no, meditation, that's not for me, or you don't think about, like you said, the fact that God has given us all these things that are important for us, then of course you're going to be attracted to things that are bad for you because they're, they're, they're there for a reason. It's like, look, if you're not going to yeah. eat meat, that you have at home in your fridge, and then you go out and you're like, "Well, I really want this donut." Well, of course you do. You're hungry, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah, and so that's fill right. yourself. You need up. breakfast, right? Fill yourself up with all of these. Like you said, tradition is not a bad word. Christian tradition yeah. that is there for you for a reason. When's the last and, time you read like something from Jonathan Edwards or John sure. Wesley, or right. I mean, go all the way back, August. And those Athanasius, dudes talked about meditation, Clement. especially. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you right. gotta know. You know, uh, I think I can't remember who said this, but one Christian guy said meditation is thinking God's thoughts after Him. It sounds that, like a Tozer that, thing. Maybe Tozer, maybe, maybe Lloyd Jones. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's good. Uh, but that's a good one. I mean, you're gonna think what God thought about something. And, right. You know, there's a story in the Old Testament where Elijah, um, well, one of the kings of Israel is sick, and he sends to Beelzebul, who is the oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Beelzebul. Uh-huh. The name means Lord of the Flies, which is where <laughs> the name of the book comes from, by the way. Lord of the Flies, Lord of the Dead. It was a, it was a death god. He sent somebody to go and ask from the Philistine god of death. 
if he was going to die or not. And Elijah sends him a message saying, is it because there's no God in Israel that you've got to go over to him and ask him? Right. Same thing for you, Christian. Is it because there's no God in your life that you've got to go to someone else's thing, this weird new age stuff? Or, right. you know, well, I believe God speaks to everybody. No, God has spoken through his son, Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And we have that in front of us. So meditate on his words. Take the time to be still and to be quiet and to think about this stuff and take the time. Focus your thinking. It'll hurt a little bit. Like, you know what I mean? Like oh, for for, sure. forcing yeah, yourself yeah. to think about something is not good. And you can train your mind, as you said a second ago, Zach, to be miserable all the time. Yep. You know, <laughs> I mean, we've seen this happen. We we have run the experiment over the last five years. Let's all be really obsessed about politics and see how it goes. Right. Man, it's been miserable, isn't it? It's like you're, either you're grumpy or someone else is grumpy. And I think we're kind of starting to slide out of it now. But boy, oh boy. That it's like, well, I don't know why everybody's so angry. Well, because they spend four hours, five hours a day learning about all the terrible things happening in the country and yep. people trying to spin a story that's even neutral to be, you know, yeah, they're to be mean. And so they it's find meditating. the worst version of, of the opponent's view and present that as a as a news story. And, yeah. you know, that that's that's why this is. But what the Bible tells us is to do the opposite of that. Train your mind for godliness. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Mm -hmm. Bible doesn't tell you how to think. Yeah, it does, man. It totally does. Focus your thinking on what is good. And the thing is, all of these benefits that people say they get from meditation and mindfulness and all this stuff, those are benefits that you will get naturally by serving the Lord in this way, by prayer and meditation and fasting and reading your Bible, even just the stillness aspect of it, the the thinking about your life instead of just letting things happen to you, like all of those things will happen as you serve the Lord. You don't need to go to the Philistines to find find these things. Exactly. Yeah. So train your mind. So I have a hard time thinking about that. I know we all do. But you've got to force yourself. You've got to take yourself there. Discipline yourself, right. you might say. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. You might say this, and I'll, I'll end with this thought, and Zach, I'll let you have the last word here. That if your body, as the Bible says, is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit dwells inside you, you might say meditation is going into that inner sanctuary and letting him talk to you. It's taking the time to be Mm -hmm. in the presence of God, who is with you, always with you. But taking the time to allow your awareness of God's presence to come to the forefront and listen to what God might have to say to you. Taking his word, taking what godly people have said to you and thinking it through, thinking about it in a focused manner so that you can then allow it to be implemented into your life. And man, will God meet you in those moments. It'll, It'll change your life. It totally will. I think if you if you're the kind of person that does this for ten years that you take God at His word in these things. We talked about some of the other disciplines that I think are easier for us to understand because we're an intellectual people. But if you take God at His word in prayer and in meditation and in fasting, things that are like we said clearly spiritual, I you're going to be a unique kind of Christian at the end of those ten years. Because there are many, yeah. many people that we will meet in heaven that are brothers and sisters that this is areas where they will always be spiritually weak. And that will cause problems in their life that God does not intend for them, right? God doesn't want us to be stressed out and angry all the time and and, and just broken spiritually. But if we do these things, the Lord will the Lord will take us at that point. If we take him at his word, he will meet us there. I've experienced this consistently. And man, the the difference it makes in your spiritual walk when you are doing these things is really like it's not even a night and day difference. It's it's an exponential thing. So yeah, I'm I'm excited and, and don't get discouraged. You know, if you have a bad week on these on this stuff, that's why they call it a discipline. You pick the pick yep. that barbell up on Monday and you get right back at it. And the Lord honors that. There's grace in all these things, right? And so it's it's a way that the Lord uses to to build us up and it's it's exciting stuff. It really is. Yeah, it is. So we're going through spiritual disciplines. We've done five. We talked about reading the Bible, studying the Bible. We're talking about prayer and fasting and meditating. And if you start doing these things, like you said, Zach, your your life is going to totally transform. If you want to grow in the Lord, how do I grow? How do I abide? How do I? You do this. Mm -hmm. You do things like this. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, if you if you want just a quick diag, you know, or what not diagnosis, whatever it is, if you want a quick prescription here, that's what it is. You know, I want to grow in the Lord. I'm having some trouble with some sin in my life. I can't get this together. Okay, start reading your Bible. 
every day and take some time during the week to chase down a couple things that make to make sure you understand them. Pray every morning, fast once a week, and meditate on what you've read throughout the day. Mm. That that is how you grow spiritually. Yep. That is, and these things take us so far beyond the intellectual inter- exercise of theology and all that, which is so necessary and so important into true communion and fellowship with God. Yep. And we've got more to come. That'll be with us uh, next time. We're going to talk about some of the more corporate spiritual disciplines. We've hit on some personal ones. Go ahead and practice these, and we will see you on the next one. Thanks, guys. See you guys. Bye.